to the Reseda Boulevard Church of Christ virtual worship service. We want to thank all those who have logged in this morning to be a part of this worship service. Whichever form of media you're using, we want to say thank you. At this time, let us bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to have various outlets of media to still worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask that you bless our congregation, bless those who are hurting, bless those who may be sick at this time. Allow this service this morning to just be an upliftment to their spirit. In your son's name we pray, amen. He's worthy, God's worthy, almighty creator, Alpha, Alpha Omega. Omega. He's beginning and the end. Yeah. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So panel sing, he's worthy. He's worthy.
you place nobody above you. Place nobody oh, above God, because you. you are the Holy One. My Lord, you're the one, you're the only one. The only and we're singing one. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. All the glory is due.
the Lord our God. see the church family. Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father God in heaven, you are so worthy to be praised. You are a God, Lord, that never, ever fails to, to fulfill your promises. And such, Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for another day that you have given us, given us an opportunity to come before your throne and give you the praise and worship that you are so worthy of. Heavenly Father, we just pray for strengthening of our faith. We pray, Heavenly Father, that at this time, as we prepare for your message, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive whatever it is in it that you would have us to receive. We pray for the speaker of the hour. May his words be illuminating. May his words be edifying to our souls. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are Lost at a time right now, Heavenly Father, with so much going on, there's so much confusion. Uh, we are dealing with the pandemic, Heavenly Father. It seems overwhelming at times. But we do know and we do trust that you are in control. And as such, Heavenly Father, help us right now to be singly minded. May our focus be exclusively on you and your son, Jesus. And again, Lord, we just pray that you will fill us with your spirit here and now. Heavenly Father, we ask for forgiveness of our sins. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will strengthen us in those areas that we are weak in. 
And Heavenly Father, above all things, we just pray, Lord, that we would be just as merciful and, grac and, and graceful to those around us as you have been unto us. We love you and we honor you. And it's in Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. Amen. At this time, we are going to have communion. And I ask that if you have the proper emblems that you get your unleavened bread and your cup uh, so that we can participate uh, in this act together. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 and verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray for the bread. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son who you sent to die and for this bread and what it represents being unleavened and that our relationships are unleavened and that they are pure and that they are right uh, with one another. We pray, Father, that uh, you continue to strengthen us and build us up in your kingdom. We know, God, that you are mighty and we just thank you for this opportunity of, of reflection and remembering um, what he did for us on the cross. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Verse 25. And after the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Let us pray for the cup. Again, God, as we continue in this prayer, we thank you uh, for your son and for the blood that was shed upon the cross. We thank you for, again, this opportunity of reflection uh, and remembering uh, his sacrifice uh, for our lives and help us, Father, to understand what it is to suffer um, as a believer and to uh, go through things and just allow us to overcome those things with our faith in you. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I really love the Lord. I really love the Lord. 
prepare to worship our Lord through giving. Just as in the communion, our giving involves two kinds of responses. Our first response is, a, is an acknowledgement of the income that God has provided for us to meet our daily needs. By faith, we return to him a just representation of our regular income, which is called the tithe. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in meeting our daily needs and for giving us the power to gain wealth. We acknowledge your faithfulness to us uh, by our giving of the tithe for the support of this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Our second response is an acknowledgement of God's graciousness uh, towards us. It's called an offering. Our offering is an expression of gratitude for what God has done uh, for us unexpectedly. When you give an offering, you are saying, thank you, Lord, for the special blessing that you have bestowed, bestowed upon me this week. And I graciously return this representation of your gracious gift. Let us offer thanks for the offering. Lord, we cheerfully bring offerings in acknowledgement of your abounding grace towards us this week. And we ask that you bless these offerings, offerings that are made, that are given cheerfully out of gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, to Jesus, Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I want to welcome you to this another online service of the Reseda Boulevard Church in which we are fulfilling our purpose of bringing light to the world. We embarked upon a, a campaign back during the holidays uh, that was based upon the birth narrative of Christ. Uh, we called that series of messages Countdown to a New Beginning because it was those uh, nar it, it was that narrative uh, and those holidays that ushered us into this new year. Not only a new year, but the actual beginning of a new decade. After a whole year, the first year that we really called a year of preparation, 2020 was God really unveiling some things in our lives and in our family and our community and our nation that we have to be aware of in terms of our need for him our need for healing, our need for reconciliation, our need for renewal is our responsibility as ministers of the gospel to discern what God is doing in the world uh, and in the lives of his people and therefore help to help them with the word of God, with the revealed word of God, to make the proper responses. It's not a time for silence. It's a time for prophets of God to actually speak up. Now, one of the things that we have been able to observe over, over the last week, we saw how deeply divided this nation really is. We saw what some will actually do to get their own way. We saw what allegiance to a person rather than allegiance to principles of constitutional law, uh, how that can lead to anarchy. We saw for the first time in our history, armed Americans siege their own capital uh, and do harm to those that were commissioned uh, and dedicated to the protection of that sacred space. Uh, we saw a president publicly invite people to come and overthrow an election uh, that was a part of this democracy, that was part of the principles of our democracy. So we are living in times that are different and we are living in desperate times. Our government is paralyzed by partisanship, economic recession, shredded, uh, our, we have a shredded international reputation and spiritually the nation seems to be seeking into chaos. We've seen all of that. And then people are asking the question, and especially to those of us who are uh, presenters of the word of God, what does God think about this? Those of us who profess to know something about the revealed word of God, uh, we've been asked to, to speak up uh, in terms of what is God's will? What is God doing? Uh, what is God doing for our nation? What is God doing in terms of our lives? So the central theme uh, that we have been listening to, and that is there is a need for national healing. There's a need for healing in our economy, in our government, in our businesses, in our schools, in our, in our cities, in our families, and even in our hearts. But let me tell you this, the good news is that the wounds that we have experienced are not fatal. Uh, healing is available. God's word is filled with examples of how God heals and uh, how he heals breaks and brokenness and heals conflict and even brings healing to a broken nation. Friends, I want to uh, share with you a passage uh, as it relates to that. We see this in Psalms 60 uh, verses two to four where David said, you have shaken this nation and split it open. Now, Lord, he says, heal the cracks before it completely collapses. He's saying there are cracks everywhere in this house. And before this house completely collapses, he is saying, heal the cracks. The message translation says, heal the breaks. Everything is coming apart at the seams. Uh, then in verse three, uh, in the NIV, it says, you have shown your people desperate times. Uh, we are staggering like we're drunk on wine. And then, of course, he brings hope uh, in the fourth verse, verses four and five. The psalmist says, uh, but you have given us a banner to rally to. All who love truth will rally to it. Then you can deliver your beloved people. Use your strong right arm to rescue us. Let me tell you something, friends. Whenever you see uh, the phrase, but you have, but God, 
but you referring to God, you can rest assured that the dose of hope is going to follow. The principles and practices of hope is going to follow uh, in going to follow that phrase because God always uh, brings hope out of despair. Now, the point is we want to deal with the issue of how does God heal our brokenness? I want to speak uh, to the subject matter, the pathway to healing and reconciliation. And this is a message that's not only uh, to you as a people of God primarily, but also to the nation, because as a people of God, we set the example. God speaks to his people because his people is simply the garden variety. It is the example. It is the model community that God, God places upon the earth. But notice that community is human. That community has fragileness. That community also have brokenness. There's no such thing as a perfect community. But God gives us the principles that we ought to practice that also uh, coincide with what God is actually doing in the world. Keep in mind, God has begun a process of new creation. The Bible says in Romans 8, he is reconciling the world to himself. And then he's given to us, referring to the community of believers, he has given to us that ministry of reconciliation. So we have to model what is expected to uh the practices that are necessary to bring light and healing to the community at large. I want you to see an example of this in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14, how God brings healing to a nation, not just to a nation because it's not a promise to any particular nation. There's nowhere in the Bible, the Bible speaks of the United States. There's, it's not talking about Russia or China. None of these nations are in the word of God in terms of the focus of scripture. But the point is the principles that God gives us first applies to the people of God. And then of course, you know, the principles of reconciliation and redemption to the world at large. But God gives a pathway. Second Chronicles 7 and verse 14 is such an example. God made a promise to Solomon at the dedication of the new temple. And when he heralded this message, you it, it's amazing. Uh, you can see how God actually operates as a redeemer. Notice the passage says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. What you see uh, in this passage, God provides a pathway to healing, which are the conditions of the promise. Every promise that God gives has prerequisites uh, because God is faithful to his promises. But the problem is we are not faithful in terms of, of meeting the conditions. And anytime a promise of God is made and you embrace that promise, you have to realize that that's a responsibility to, to satisfy the conditions of that promise. And if you do that, your life is going to be enriched. Uh, now in this text, there are four prerequisites of healing uh, that results in a threefold promise uh, associated with that. Now, this is not just a promise. Understand this. This is not just a promise for the healing of a nation, but for any condition of brokenness in our lives personally, in our lives socially or relationally, in our lives financially, in our lives spiritually. These are principles that brings about healing and reconciliation, it brings about recovery. And that's why we're presenting these in times like this, in desperate times such as this. National healing, understand this, national healing only happens if God's people lead by example. That's why it says, if my people called by my name, that means that the onus of responsibility, when we look out at what's going on around us, when we look out at what is happening in our lives, uh, if you're a child of God, if you're called by uh, God's name and there's, there's turmoil that's going on in your home that may involve unbelievers, the onus of responsibility to bring about victory 
uh, is upon you as a child of God. He said there are four prerequisites, four conditions of healing and reconciliation that you need to acknowledge. The first principle is this. Here's the first principle for national healing or personal healing. It says we must humbly confess our sins. Notice it says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Now, this is not a promise for everyone but for followers of Christ. We're responsible for doing what God expects uh, of his people, of his creatures. He says, if my people were called by my name, for followers of Christ, if you are a child of God, you are called by his name. And the number one cause, understand this, the number one cause of our problem is, of our problems is pride and self-sufficiency. That's why he says the first step is to humble Yourself. He's talking about humble confession, the humble confession, the humility of confessing your sins, uh, our sins. James four and verse six, the Bible says God opposes the proud, but give grace to the humble. What is grace? That's the power to change. So this is the humility of confessing our sins. First John one and verse seven says this. If we claim that we are not sinning, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Friends, if you are human beings, you have failures in your life and you have to always be transparent uh, before others and, and, and before God uh, by the fact that you are human and you have failures. Notice the illustration. Uh, we, we often uh, see the phrase or we hear the phrase you love sinners and hate sin. But let me give you a more accurate way of stating that love sinners and hate my sin. I need to love sinners and hate my sin. Better, that's a better way of stating that because that is simply saying we need to stop worrying about uh, everyone else's sin and start looking at ourselves. Now notice the problem is this, and I'll give you a problem associated with each one of these steps. Now the problem associated with humble confession of our sin is this, we spend more time accusing others and excusing ourselves. Uh, so, you know, we don't really self-focus. We're always looking at the sins of what's going on around us or the person, you know, that we're in conflict with. The point is, listen to the passage in James 4 and verse 12. The Bible said God gave us his laws so that he alone can rightly judge us and he alone has the right to save or destroy. So who do you think you are to judge and condemn your neighbors? Notice also in Romans 2 and verse 3, the Bible says we usually point at others. Uh, the, the Bible talks about how as believers and covenant people, we often use our relationship to point fingers at others. And what we're doing when we're pointing at the sins of others is, is taking away the focus from ourselves. And this is what Romans 2 and verse 3 is about. It says, so when you, a mere human, pass judgment on others and yet you do the similar sins, how do you think you will escape God's judgment? See, the point is, whenever you're pointing your finger at someone else, guess what? There are three fingers pointing back at you. And that's why when Paul talks about spiritual warfare, he said, first fulfill before you can really engage in this spiritual warfare, uh, bringing into captive, captivity every thought, having a readiness to revenge all disobedience. He said, make, make sure your obedience is fulfilled. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, the Bible said, for it is, it is time for judgment to begin and it must begin with us. He said, judgment must start with the family of God. Friends, we have to first look at how ill-prepared we are as a faith community to address the ills and the divisiveness of society. We have to show, we have to acknowledge what's going on, how culture has impacted the church, how racism even exists among us and, and in our church, in our church community, in our fellowship, and uh, be willing to honestly and sincerely address those type of issues because that's why God raises all of this for that process to begin and that judgment to begin, the Bible said, with the house of God. Our attempt to cover up sin 
is bound for failure. We don't want people to really take a good look, a close look, you know, at the fellowship of the church and see the risks, you know, in terms of blackness and whiteness and culture and ethnicity and all of these type of divisions. If we don't people want people to look at it, they're going to see it. And so we have to be we have to be upfront in terms of addressing that type of issue. Notice in Proverbs 28 and verse 13, the Bible said people who try to cover up their sins will not succeed. But if they confess and forsake them, they will receive mercy. So the first step to any kind of recovery, whether it be national recovery, personal recovery, social uh, recovery, is always humble confession. James 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? That you may be healed. I want you to circle the phrase, confess to each other. We have to acknowledge to each other. Note this, uh, and I want you to write this down. I need others to help me change. We only change with the help of others. God designed it that way. God designed that spiritual change takes place uh, in this manner. And why? Because, because God made us as social beings and he made us to be dependent upon one another. You cannot effect change in your life without the assistance of us. That's why the church provides what is called fellowship context. We, we provide small groups. We have recovery groups, support groups, uh, life groups, online groups, why? Because you need to have a dynamic relationship with others to affect change in your life. Here's the first thing that you and that you need to do. And I want to give you this is the first homework assignment. And that is make a list of sins in your life and then confess. Once you confess them, cross them out. You may need to get with somebody very close to you to be transparent about, you know, faults and failures in your own in your own situation. And you confess your faults and then you cross them out. Uh, of that list and then burn the paper. Here's the second principle. So once we can humbly confess our sins, then we must, the Bible says, pray sincerely. Notice it says that my people that are called by my name will humble themselves, step one, and pray. Uh, and pray. Now understand this, he's talking about sincere praying. It is not half-hearted, thoughtless, meaningless praying, it's not ritual praying. How people can develop rote type of prayers until the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you know, are prayers that we have memorized. Now lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord and myself. This, this is not that type of praying. In other words, praying uh, in this context, when you're seeking healing and renewal from God, it is it is authentic praying. It is passionate praying. It is even desperate prayer. God, I need you in my life right now. It is like Jacob in in that story of Genesis 28, Jacob wrestling with God, wrestling with the angel. And he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. So what Jacob was doing, Jacob, uh, in other words, he was being desperate in terms of his need for God, God's help in his life. See, our problem when we think about how do we get to such a state and condition uh, that we're experiencing in our circumstances, we spend this is the problem associated with, 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 with step number two, we spend more time complaining than we do praying. Prayer changes things. Worrying about and griping about things does not change things. Being anxious does not change anything. Griping does not change anything. Friends, and let me tell you something. Spending more time uh, complaining is not a new problem. In Hosea, the seventh chapter in verse 14, uh, the prophet says, uh, they do not cry out to me. God said they do not cry out to me with sincere hearts. Instead, they sit on their couches and wail. How many times do we sit back every day just watching what's going on in, in media and simply complaining about it, but we're never praying about it? Uh, we're, not, we're not even acting or doing anything about it. So we spend too much time sitting and complaining about what's going on in our world. The point is, Scripture teaches us that when we pray, uh, sincere praying, we must be sincere and we have to be earnest. Notice Colossians 4 and verse number 2. The Bible said, be earnest and unwearied and steadfast in your prayer. Being alert and intent in your praying with thanksgiving. But the question becomes, how can you be, how can I be earnest and sincere? Well, let me tell you how to do it. 
how to be more sincere uh, in your prayers. Uh, and that is simply by being more specific. That is, you must pray with intent. And the application, here's a simple application, and that is make a prayer list. Do you not know that nothing becomes specific until you write it down? So let me give you a second homework assignment, and that is to make a list, de develop a prayer journal of specific things that you are asking God for this year. And that's a challenge that's going to be a, that is a part of the campaign that we're asking you to start praying about right now. You know, as you as you make certain commitments of purpose, we want you to be specific and we're leading you in these commitments to be specific in terms of what you are asking God to do for you even this year. So you need to write down, make a journal of what what you uh, want God. You're going to be asking God to do this year in your life or in the church or in the nation. Write it down. And this is where you do it. Write down the date of the request, what you are requesting. And then when that prayer is answered, you just write down uh, on the third column the date it was answered. Let me tell you something. When you go back and look at that journal after you've kept that journal over a few months, uh, even a year, you're going to see how many times your prayer was. And you're going to see God responding to your prayer. And guess what that's going to do It's going to build your faith. Is going to be your faith because that's that's what God does when God. That's why God tells you to ask, because he already knows before you answer. He already knows what you want, but he tells you to ask and he asks you to he wants you to be specific and he wants you to be earnest about it. That is, he wants you to be intense about it. So the point is that you ask and you write down, you keep a journal so that when God answers your prayer it's going to build your faith. That's why James 15, uh, John 15 says, uh, when you are fruitful, he will prune you that you can bring forth more fruit. That is, every time God answers a prayer, that's like being pruned. And he gives you the excitement to keep on praying and asking God as you're seeking that type of relationship with God. Here's the, here's the meaning of sincere praying. Ephesians 6 and verse 18 says this. Pray in the spirit at all times with all kinds of prayers, asking for all you need to do this, you must always be ready to give up, to never give up. Always pray for all God's people. Now, what I want you to do is simply circle all of the alls and always in that verse. And you'll get an idea of what it simply means to pray sincerely and with specificity. Notice in Luke uh, chapter 18 and verse 1, Jesus told a story to his disciples about how they should keep on praying and never give up. Why? Because let me tell you something. You're either doing one or the other. You're either praying or you have given up. If there are things on your list that you're praying about and you, know, you find yourself no longer praying, you know what you've done? You have given up. And that's what the emphasis of this pack, that passage is in Luke 18. God wants you to keep on praying until you see God's response. And he says, never give up. Here's the third principle to the to the pathway in the pathway of healing uh, in terms of our brokenness. It says we must seek God. Notice it says that my people which are called by my name will humble themselves, number one, and pray, number two, and do what? And seek my face, number three. That is, uh, this is not, let me understand, when the Bible says, I want you to understand that when the Bible says seek his face, it's not talking about pastime, a spare moment kind of seeking. It must be serious pursuit. It must, seeking God must be your primary focus. Why? Because Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, uh, God rewards those who diligently seek him. See, you don't become an Olympic athlete in your spare time. You know, you it must be your primary focus to be a pro at anything requires intensity. Somebody may ask you about playing golf. You may play golf and just like I periodically play golf, but I'm not a golfer. Uh, and the reason I'm not a golfer, because it's not my primary focus. Yeah. You know, you have to be uh, to become a pro golfer. You have to you have to do that intensely. It requires intensity. So what does God want from you this year? When you, when, I, when you ask the question, uh, what is it that God really wants of me more than anything else? Let me tell you what that is. He wants you to intensely seek him, not seeking his blessings or his gifts or his favor or his goodness or even his forgiveness. But he wants you to seek him. 
And let me tell you something. This is a rare kind of pursuit. It's very rare because most people, when they see God uh, or go to God, they're really going for a blessing. They're going for uh, something in particular, some special need uh, of this kind or another. And few people make knowing God a goal of their life. The Lord is looking. The Bible says in Psalm 14 and verse two that God is looking down from heaven to find someone. He said, is there one person with real understanding who seeks for God? Here's the problem. The problem is we spend more time seeking everything else. But God offers us a promise. And I want you to note this promise in Deuteronomy, uh, in Deuteronomy 20, uh, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 29 to 31. The Bible says this. God says, if you seek the Lord, Moses says, if you seek the Lord, your God, you will find him. Now, that's the promise. Say, if you seek him, you will find him. If you look for him with all of your heart, that's intensity. And with all of your soul, that's intensity. When you are in distress and all of these things have happened to you, you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For he is merciful. He is a merciful God. And he will not abandon or destroy you. So the point is, God wants you to seek him with intensity. He wants you to put him first. The question becomes, how do, uh, how do we do this? How do we spend more time uh, rather than spend time doing everything else? How do we put God or seek God with intensity? Let me give you two examples. You'll find this on the website uh, as it relates to the five purposes. Uh, we make the same suggestions behind each commitment that you make. We show you how to put this, how to make this applicable in your life. And, and two of the things that we uh, have suggested as it relates to knowing him, getting to know God, seeking the face of God, and that is to practice what is called him first, Matthew 6, 33. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Him first simply means he's going to be your He's going to be your first friend. He's going to be your first interest. He's going to be your first relationship. He's going to be the first scheduled appointment. He's going to be your first resort when you get in trouble. That's the first practice. It's a devotional practice. The second practice is something we introduced during the James series called his word first, his word last word, his word first word, his word last word. And that's the idea that you put a Bible by your bedside. And the first thing that you do uh, when you get up in the morning, before you check your uh, your email, before you turn on the news, turn on the television, you just read a passage out of God's word. And you just read as much as it takes for that passage in some way to speak to you. Don't have to read a whole chapter. Just read a few verses. When it speaks to you, just lay it down. And then when you get ready to go to bed before you, uh, after you've done everything else and before you get into the bed, you pick up that Bible, which is by your bedside and just read a few, read a few verses until it speaks to you. And then you put it down. It's called his word, first word, his word, last word. That's a devotional exercise. There are other ways of, of doing a daily devotions, but we just give the, those two as an example. So, God wants you to seek him intensely. Here's the last thing. We must turn back to God completely. Here's the fourth step, the fourth step in the pathway for healing, and that is to turn back to God completely. The Bible says uh, if they will turn and they must turn from their wicked ways. Now, the word turn in Greek is, is the word metanoia. Uh, it's a compound word, meta, which means uh, change. Uh, turn and noia, which is the Greek word associated with the word noose, the Greek uh, word for mind, the highest part of the mind called the noose. Metanoia means to change your mind. And that's what repentance means. It is a change of mind. You can say, I once thought about this this way, but now I think about it another way. So that's the idea of repentance. Here's the problem associated with turning back to God completely. And that is we just don't see our own wickedness. Friends, it is a mistake to categorize people as either good or wicked. We often put ourselves somewhere in between uh, being good and wicked. The point is, the reality is, all of us have wicked ways. When you look at the list of sins in uh, the Word of God, there are several lists of sins in the Word of God. And I want to just give you one in 2 Timothy. Uh, what is it? 2 Timothy 3 and verses two to nine, two to five. There are 19 specific ways uh, called wicked ways. It's amazing when you look at this, how uh, much you see this in our culture today. And what Paul is doing is talking about the condition of 
the times, the condition of the culture in the last times. Notice in this text, he said people will be self-absorbed, uh, loving only themselves. They will be greedy for money. They will be boastful, arrogant, insulting to God, rude and disrespectful even to their parents. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unkind and, and unforgiving. They will enjoy slandering others. They will have no self-control. They will love violence and be a uh, cruel uh, they would be cynical, despising anyone and anything that is good. They will betray those uh, loyal to them. They will be reckless and rash. They will be inflated with self-conceit. They will love pleasure more than God. They'll claim to be spiritual and will reject the true power that makes them godly. The point is, uh, it's amazing when you look at this, to see how much this describes not only our culture, but even uh, conditions of our own heart. The point is that we have to measure ourselves continuously uh, by these particular things. And not that God is charging us with all of this, but the point is that God expects us to be responsible and transparent about our failure, about our frustrations, about our faults and constantly turn away from these things to be completely sold to God. Now notice in Acts 3 and verse 16, uh, you'll see that there's only one solution to this. It is not political, it's not economic, it's not psychological, it's not educational. Our hearts must be changed by God. The Bible says, repent and turn to God so that your sins be wiped out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Friends, we desperately need the times of refreshing. Now, I want to end this message by talking about the threefold promise that's associated uh, that comes about when we do uh, and take those four steps. That is what happens when we uh, when we confess our sins humbly, when we pray sincerely, when we seek God with intensity, when we turn back to God completely, what does God promise? He would do three things. He says that my people will call by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He said, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Friends, let me tell you something in conclusion that the church must lead the way. We must be the model. We cannot profess to be perfect. Our fellowship is not perfect. Our fellowship, when this pandemic came about, you know, as a fellowship of churches, we are ill prepared to actually meet the challenge of being a voicing what God's will is for this pandemic, uh, for, for our communities. Friends, we have to prepare ourselves. We have to be the type of community uh, with respect for otherness. Uh, we have to break down the barriers of racism and segregation, even among us. And I don't believe there's any, any fellowship that's more prepared and more equipped to, to do this because we have a high vision of the community of faith. We have a high vision of the word of God. But what we have to do as we prepare to pr begin praying for this nation and praying for our congregation and praying for our families as a fellowship, as a, as a family of believers at Reseda, we must, number one, humbly confess our sins. We must, we must secondly, sincerely pray uh, with, with, with specificity, that is being specific in terms of things that we're asking God to do in our lives. We must seek God with intensity and we must turn to God completely. Why is it so important for us to do this? Because there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 31 that says this, and this, is, this, tell the, this tell you why it's so important to judge yourself. The Bible says if we judge ourselves in the right way, God will not judge us. So the church has to lead the way. We have to be the first to recognize what's wrong uh, in our fellowship and begin to correct those things and draw people close together, bring about the unity that God intends. If you're a child of God, if you're, if you're not a child of God and you've been a part of these meetings and have not yet made that step, have not yet crossed the line, let me tell you the four things that you have to do first. First, admit you know, that you have a need for redemption and reconciliation and healing.
Secondly, you have to acknowledge that, uh, that you have to accept Christ as the person who provides that uh, as your savior. And then you have to acknowledge him as God because he has the power to bring healing. He has the power to heal, forgive, uh, and to hear your prayers. And then you have to be willing to act on his word. Friends, are you willing to make that uh, commitment? And we are, we are in, we're encouraging and uh, encouraging every child of God, every member of the Receda Church, uh, to take this opportunity of the new year to have a new beginning. Go online and look at the five commitments of purpose and begin praying over the next two weeks before you ever make one uh, commitment, before you fill out any form online. We want you to pray for three, for two, for 21 days uh, up until January 31st and fast one day a week over the commitments that God wants you to make. We want your life to be in complete harmony, uh, in complete alignment with God's will. And then the, the thing is, if you need to be anonymous, you don't have to sign your name. We just want you to be willing to say, because if you if you can't have a commitment that you're not willing to share with others, if you're not willing to state your commitments of faith, friends, it's not faith. The Bible says, if you shall say to this mountain. So we want you to pray about the commitments that got a purpose to get your life in complete alignment with God's will so you can experience a new beginning. And anyone who wants to join us in this countdown campaign will do that. We're going to begin making a thrust that every member of the church make commitments of purpose, that their lives can be in complete alignment with God's will for their immediate future. Will you pray with me? God, we're so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful for the blessings that you give us. We're so grateful that you have made us a community uh, that gives light to the world. Help us to take the steps of reconciliation that we can pray that these steps be taken even in the community at large because that's our purpose and that's our calling to participate in your work of reconciling the world to yourself. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.